Fishermen furious over the price of snow crabs set for the upcoming season. David Johnson will be paid up to $1,600 per day to research foreign interference in our elections. A Canadian fighter jet is headed to Japan to help enforce U.S. sanctions against North Korea. And Scotiabank is the largest foreign investor in an Israeli arms manufacturer. Good morning. It's Friday, April 7th. It's Good Friday, April 7th. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. We start this morning in Newfoundland and Labrador, where a government-appointed price-setting panel has set the price of snow crab for the upcoming season at $2.20 per pound. The price per pound at the start of last season was close to $8. Inland fishermen are represented by the Fish, Food and Alliance Workers Union, or FFAW, and they are unsurprisingly furious. They had asked for a price to be set at $3.10 per pound. President Greg Pretty said that the decision was a catastrophe. Pretty told CBC Radio, quote, you can't get crew members for that. You can't even pay crew members on that type of money. There's a net economic point where it doesn't make sense to fish. And that panel hit it right on, spot on. A drop in demand in international markets has been blamed on the drop in price. The price panel was struck when the fishermen and the crab industry lobby group couldn't decide on a price. Originally, the workers were looking for $3.48 per pound. As someone who loves snow crab, this seems like a really obvious example of how international markets have way too much control over how well Canadian workers are paid. And this could pretty easily be solved if there was a planned economy that put the interests of the folks actually harvesting the crab first. Anyway, if you like eating crab too, watch out to see how much less you'll be paying for Newfoundland and Labrador snow crab this year. I bet you won't see a dip in the price at the supermarket. Next to national news, former university administrator and Governor General David Johnson is gearing up for his next role, part-time, quote, foreign interference special rapporteur. And information about that role, including his pay, has been made public. Rachel Aiello from CTV News reports that the information was in two orders in council from last week. Johnson is expected to, quote, assess the extent and impact of foreign interference in Canada's electoral processes, unquote, with an eye to 2019 and 2021 specifically. The 81-year-old is also supposed to, quote, identify innovative approaches and improvements in the way public agencies work together to combat foreign interference. Part of this work seems to be just collating reports from agencies like CSIS, the Privy Council, the PMO, Cabinet, and, quote, other relevant agencies or officials, unquote. Once he has this information, he will also see what the agency did to respond to any issues that they had identified. Just how much money is this kind of work worth? Well, he's employed from March 15th to December 20th, and his per diem will be between $1,400 and $1,600 per day. That's what per diem means. It's per day, by the way. He will also be paid for all living and travel costs associated with the job, any staff he might need, and so on. I swear, I'm having flashbacks to when Johnson was appointed to figure out how to have a televised election debate. Do you remember that? He headed up a committee that also had a Kielberger brother on it until the charity was torpedoed by their own gross behavior. And that committee recommended that all party leaders with a seat in the House of Commons should be on the platform for an election debate. All of that just to say to Maxim Bernier to go away. It was a very expensive waste of time that the networks themselves should have just sorted out together. But if that's the kind of work that David Johnson is around to be appointed for, I guess, I don't know, the 81-year-old has got some time and um, he's happy to oblige a 15 or 16 or $1,400 a day gig. Next, Reuters is reporting that Canada is deploying military aircraft to aid in implementing sanctions against North Korea. For six weeks, the aircraft, a CP-140 Aurora, will fly around the sea looking for, quote, ship-to-ship transfers of fuel and other commodities, unquote. Aside, ever since that truck-to-truck transfer of propane in North Toronto years ago caused a massive explosion that killed two people, if I remember correctly, I use the term truck-to-truck transfer regularly. Glad to add ship-to-ship transfer to my vocabulary now. 
back to the news. This is a proxy war. North Korea has been sanctioned since 2006 due to its nuclear and ballistic missile programs. So why are we heading there now, you might ask? Well, South Korea and the U.S. have been doing military drills nearby, and North Korea was like, don't do that, and then tested a nuclear-capable underwater attack drone. Then China and Russia blamed joint military drills for provoking North Korea, and then the U.S. accused China and Russia of emboldening North Korea. So in short, this is all part of a thing called friend shoring that Christian Freeland talks about. We are on the side of our friends. Now, how much will this cost? Who knows? What isn't reported in the Reuters article, but what I did grab from the Department of National Defense website, is that Canada has had eight deployments already under this mission called Operation Neon. Prior to 2019, although they are still calling it this in the videos that have been posted in the last couple of weeks, it was called Operation Projection, which honestly, guys, that's uh, that's pretty funny. No wonder you changed it. Last week, the HMCS Montreal left Halifax to make its way to Australia and then back. There will be 247 crew members and they'll be gone for six months. The ship is being sent as part of the same project to patrol the sea and to see what we can see. A video released by the Department of National Defense says that we send ships because the, quote, Indo-Pacific region is important to Canada politically and economically. It's that economically piece that I feel like we're not talking about as uh, enough. What are what are our warships doing to secure Canada's economy in the Indo-Pacific region? Anyway, as I asked in the last segment, do we know how much this costs? We don't know. But is this escalating something? Mm, probably. It probably is. And it's also very important to note that, of course, as part of Russia's war and attacks on Ukraine, There are global forces that are trying to change the poles of power, and that is what's happening here as well, which is why you have the United States on one side and China and Russia on the other when it comes to North Korea and Canada jumping in willingly to pay money to patrol the sea. Now, I have a few updates for you of stories that I've brought to you in the last couple of weeks that I wanted to close the loop on. Remember the story I told you about Vianne Timmins, the president of the Memorial University of Newfoundland? Well, Timmins, she's out. After having committed identity fraud by claiming that she had Mi'kmaq ancestry, she does not. The university's board has decided, or maybe she decided, or maybe lawyers decided, that she's resigned. So good news there. Now, second, remember the doctor who had been prescribing Zempic, that diabetes drug that many people have been using off-label as a weight loss drug? He'd been prescribing them to many, many, many Americans out of a BC-based pharmacy. Well, The College of Physicians of Nova Scotia has found him and has sanctioned him. His name is Dr. David Davison. He wrote more than 17,000 prescriptions in a couple of months for the drugs, mostly for Americans. The Americans then filled the prescriptions in British Columbia. It seems that Davidson might not even live in Nova Scotia at all. CBC reports that someone with his name listed as a member of the Nova Scotia College has an address in Odessa, Texas. And third, this is not a story that I've talked about, but I just want to give you a heads up. Last night, there were still almost a million people without power 24 hours after an ice storm hit Ottawa, Montreal and surrounding regions. There were more than 200,000 people in Ottawa, Gatineau that had no power and the rest were in Montreal and in the Monterey. Remember, you think it's expensive to transition our economy off oil? Well, guess what is more expensive? And finally... The Intercept's Murtaza Hussain is reporting that Scotiabank holds the largest foreign share of Elbit Systems, which Hussain says is, quote, Israel's premier defense contractor. Angus Wong, who helped organize a petition demanding that Scotiabank divest from Elbit Systems, said, quote, we demand to know why Scotiabank is investing hundreds of millions of dollars of funds from middle class families into this company, unquote. Scotiabank holds about a $500 million stake in the company. To compare, TD and Royal Bank, who also have stakes in the company, hold only about $3 million. Hussein goes through some interesting information about Scotiabank's asset management company called 1832 Asset Management and one of its divisions called Dynamic Funds. One of the executives of Dynamic Funds is a guy called David Fingold, who has quite the political opinions and has sold shares of companies when they come under public pressure for having slight pro-Palestinian positions. It's worth reading Hussein's reporting on David Fingold. 
But back to Elbit Systems itself. They arm military units that work in the occupied Palestinian territories. They develop drone technology, weapon systems, munitions, and surveillance tools for the Israeli military. Their drones have been used in brutal attacks, including against children in Gaza and the West Bank, and also in Ethiopia. They also develop cluster bombs. Language at the Scotia Bank website about ethical investing raises some questions. Do people who invest with Scotia Bank even know that their money is being used to fund war crimes? National funds in Australia, Sweden, and Norway have all divested from Elbit, as has HSBC, over human rights concerns. Those are your headlines for Friday, April 7th. It is, as I said, Good Friday. So I hope that if you are celebrating Good Friday, that you have a lot of fun in the Easter Vigil Mass today. That's a three hour long Mass. No one goes anymore. And just so you know, I will be back on Monday, even though it's a stat holiday as well in Quebec. But Sandy Nora is going to take a break this week. Uh, We're taking a holiday. So why not? So we'll be back the week after, but I'll be back on Monday morning. If you're celebrating Easter this weekend, I hope you have a wonderful time with family and friends. And if you still haven't had a Passover Seder and that is coming tonight, I hope you enjoy.